My name is Mary Ann Shuko, and I'm a co-founder and manager of All's Authors. We are the global community of authors writing about Alzheimer's and dementia from personal experience. And we welcome you to our very first virtual Q&A, everything you always wanted to know about living with dementia, but were afraid to ask. Thank you for sharing your precious time with us this morning. I'd like to introduce some of the members of our management team who are with us today at the moment. I see Vicki Tapia, if you wanna give a wave. And is there anyone else? Yes, Anne. Anne. Where's Anne? I don't see her. Right here. Anne Campanella, Jean Lee, and my co host, Dan Corcoran, who was helping us with um, all the technical parts of, of this meeting. All the registrants um, were encouraged to submit questions for the panelists, and we will ask as many of these questions as we can in the allotted time, which is about one hour. Any questions that we are not asked will be posted to our Facebook page, Alzheimer's and Dementia Resources, and the panelists can answer them there. So you might wanna check that out later on. Also, all participants are being entered into a raffle for a copy of our first anthology, Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiving Stories. 58 authors share their inspiring personal stories. The book is available in Kindle, paperback and audio, and the winner can choose which one they'd like. Unfortunately, paperbacks can only be sent to winners in the United States. So I'd like to introduce our panelists today. You can wave when I say your name. Peter Berry ran the family's timber business for decades before being diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at age 50. He immediately stopped working and fell into a deep depression. After some time, he realized that he still had a life to live. He overcame his depression and now fills his days with cycling across the English countryside with his friends and advocating for those with dementia in his community and on social media. To date, he has raised more than 20,000 pounds for dementia charities through cycling challenges. He tells his story in slow puncture Living Well with Dementia, written with the help of his friend, Deb Bunt. He lives by the sea in Suffolk, England with his wife, Teresa. Dr. Jennifer Butte, FRCGP, lives in a dementia-inclusive retirement village in Somerset, England, about 140 miles or 225 kilometers west of London. Previously, she worked in Africa as a doctor before working as a GP or family doctor for 25 years and she was involved in medical education. She was diagnosed with dementia 10 years ago. She speaks at conferences and on radio and has been involved in television programs, raising awareness and understanding of dementia. She passionately believes more can be done to improve both the present and the future for those living with the condition. Her book, Dementia from the Inside, A Doctor's Personal Journey of Hope is her story and explains these principles. She has a website, gloriousopportunity.org, which includes many videos where she discusses different aspects of the condition and she blogs on Facebook at Glorious Opportunity. Michael Allen Bogan was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 49 after experiencing symptoms for 10 years. This led to an early retirement from his career in information technology. Following his diagnosis, he has become an outspoken advocate for those with dementia and has written articles and blog posts in addition to his book, From the Corner Office to Alzheimer's. He has appeared on podcasts and television and has testified before the United States Congress. Michael lives in Chesapeake City, Maryland with his wife, Sherry. Wendy Mitchell started a blog, Which Me Am I Today? After being diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's and vascular dementia in 2014, she was 58. Her blog eventually became a memoir, Somebody I Used to Know. Wendy remains active in the dementia community, participating in workshops and lectures across England. She has a very active Twitter presence, which she calls her lifeline. She lives in England in Yorkshire with her two daughters nearby. And Herta Saunders was the associate director of and taught in the gender studies program at the University of Utah. She also taught gender and literature courses in the English department. At the age of 61, she was diagnosed with cerebral microvascular disease, a precursor to dementia. She retired a year later. 
She maintains an active lifestyle, writing and speaking about the disease in a variety of settings. She is the author of Memories Last Breath, Field Notes on My Dementia, and blogs at Living with My Dementia. She lives in Utah with her husband, Peter. So welcome, everyone. We have a, a number of different questions here. Some people uh, submitted questions specifically for an, in, um, a particular indiv individual, and others are directed to anyone who cares to answer. So I, I had a question for both Wendy and, and Michael. And um, Michael has recently moved to a new home, quite recently. And Wendy also moved house while she was living with, with dementia. And the um, question is, how did you overcome all the difficulties of moving house and knowing where everything was when you needed it? So Wendy, why don't you start? Well, I hadn't realized, I was very naive and hadn't realized how difficult it would be to get used to a new house and a new village. Mm -hmm. And because I live alone, you know, obviously my daughters are always there for me if I need them. But actually living alone meant I had to find a way to overcome any difficulties that dementia threw at me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to live alone. So when I moved, um, the first thing I changed was the, my little kitchen had two doors and I, I'd forget what was at the other side of the door. So I'd go round and round in circles for ages, just trying to find the way around my own house. So eventually I just got my screwdriver out and took the doors down simply so that I could see what was at the other side of the doors. And also I don't see wardrobes or cupboards because they're, they blend into the walls. And so I simply stuck photographs of the contents of each just to, it's the photographs that attract my attention saying, there's cups in here, there's clothes in here. So every time dementia throws a problem at me, I try and solve it to enable me to continue living alone at home. Yeah. There's some powerful wisdom in that. And Michael, how, how did you manage with your new move? Well, for me, it was uh, very challenging uh, because I knew I, had a problem with getting myself to do things. And uh, I almost had to force myself. And because of that, I actually started eight months before the move. Uh, it was kind of easy at first to kind of put things in boxes, but I got to tell you, it got to a point that I didn't know how to even put things in boxes because I didn't know how to organize and what I should organize. So luckily for me, I happen to have a uh, wife who was able to help me and kind of direct me on what I should put in boxes and things like that. I gotta tell you, towards the end, I had no choice. I just started throwing anything and everything in the boxes because I just didn't know how to tie them all together or how I'm gonna need them. So I just kind of threw it all together. Uh, the good news is I know that the end is coming to all this, you know, now that we're unpacking and I'm so looking forward to the day that I can finally say, I don't have to do any more of this and just relax. For us, we were also building a home at the same time. So it was really hard. <laughs> yes, Wendy. The, the, the community around you can help so much with this. I, I, I met my neighbors by trying to let myself into their house because we live, I live in a row of four identical houses. So none of my neighbors were safe at the beginning. So I had to make my house different. So I simply stuck two forget-me-not tiles, one each side of the front door. But my yeah. neighbors, the community around me, rallied around me. And because I spoke out, I told them I had dementia. And they were, some were, hesitant in the beginning 
and and said, well, I'm not sure how to speak to you. And I said to them, well, how do you want me to speak to you? I turned it round and they, they then realised that I'm just an ordinary person and dementia is just a small part of me. Mm-hmm. And with their help, then I can wander around my community because I know there's always people there to help. So communities are really important. Yes, yes, I can see that. And thank you for your entertaining story about going to the long house. Anybody, of, of the others, um, I think some of you have moved too, um, Dr. Yu and um, Carter, you also moved. Was it during your dementia or was it before that? Um, I, we moved because my husband, he's died now. <laughs> he died just after we moved. Um, he couldn't cope with me not being able to cope. <laughs> yeah. So it's, we, cause we are the same person, but we don't have the same skills. We have different ones, don't we? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I moved to this community, um, of about 200 people It's a dementia friendly one. And when I came, nobody else here had dementia, did they? (laughs) But it's interesting because I was so open, like Wendy said, you know, we use these things as opportunities Mm -hmm. for educating other people. So if people ran away from me, if they heard I had dementia, I would follow them and (laughs) explain and, um, and so on. And it's wonderful. And now, of course, everyone has outed. (laughs) It's wonderful. So we, we work together, but unfortunately, well, it's not unfortunate. You're right. We have to find another way of doing it. As whatever life throws at us, we have to find a way. And living in a community with so many others, it's a different kind of learning curve. And I use technology, but that's probably another subject, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And Herda, what was your experience moving? You're on mute, Gerda. Yeah, unmute. Hmm. Let me see if I can do it. No. Roseanne, we unmute Herda. You unmute Gerda. Yeah. Um, it's a little microphone on your screen. Yeah, I think um, Roseanne has to. Uh, oh, yeah, go, Gerda, you're fine now. Okay, Herda. Herda. Oh, uh, uh, am, am I audible yes. now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, my husband and I decided to move from our house because we just found we couldn't manage um, the garden. I used to love working in the garden, but it just became an object of stress to me because I could not make it the way I used to be able to have it, um, you know, not perfect. I, it, I, I never have the perfect garden, but it had to work in a certain way. So for those reasons, we moved to a um, to a flat block of flats um, in the same neighborhood. Uh, and even so, I had to learn all the walking paths around um, where we live now. But it's a wonderful area because there are paths going sort of for a long enough distance that I can get my 10,000 steps a day in. Mm. Um, but uh, it was very confusing, but we had a lot of help. And I also started, you know, probably six months before, started organizing. And I experienced the same thing. And I just have to say, it feels to me like I'm in a, a, a family today of with my fellow dementors. It feels like cousins I have rediscovered after many years, because just the the fact is that we all can speak and we've written, but our daily lives are so confusing. And I just sit here and I just want to (laughs) get, I want to cry when I hear, it's not just only me. You know, Mm -hmm. I may look to people as though I'm doing okay, but under the surface, you all of you know how, every little thing 
is like a huge puzzle that you have to work on all the time. And by the end of the day, you are so exhausted, you can't even think anymore. And so I just want to say it's so wonderful to discover this, that mm -hmm. all of us have that in common. Thank you, Hera. Thank you. Um, Peter, I have a question for you. It says, Peter, I know you're very physically active. Do you notice improvement in your memory or mental processes immediately after engaging in physical activity? Or do you notice a decline when you're not active? Yeah, um, cycling and, and any type of physical activity is, is the thing that I think breathes life into me. Um, if I sit at home and the weather is bad or it's, uh, you know, I, I can't go out for whatever reason, I do find as though dementia weighs heavier than it does when I'm out. When I'm out, I become, when I'm out, when I'm cycling, I become Peter the cyclist. Um, when I'm at home, I become Peter with dementia. And I think that um, yeah, my, my dementia monster is a lot happier if I sit at home. He's not very happy if I'm out mm. cycling, doing my own thing. And I think that trying to keep the bit below our eyebrows very healthy helps the bit above our eyebrows, if, if that makes sense. And uh, it's, it's part of me being responsible for my own self and my own well-being. Um, I try not to take drugs for depression or anything like that. I, I just need to get outside. And that's, that's the best and easiest pill that I can swallow. That's, that's great. And I know that um, others of you, like Wendy in particular, is a, is a big walker. Ooh. How does, how does the, your walking habit affect you? Is it the same as it is for Peter? Yeah, if I'm... I feel trapped inside if if I as Peter said as Deb, uh, Peter said um if if the weather is bad I go and get wet because I I don't like being cooped up inside because I can feel dementia just taking over me and as Peter said, it's a heavier weight if I can't do the things that I want to do. Just the fresh air, just just looking around at nature. I, I, I love taking photographs. So just being able to do that makes my day a better one, just like cycling does for Peter. It gives us a sense of purpose, doesn't it? It does, yes. Mm -hmm. And I know I enjoy seeing your pictures every day. Dr. Jennifer? Well, as you, I'm sure you know, and you would expect me to say it, exercise is known, scientifically yeah. good, known that it does our brain good. Yeah. <laughs> and it's something with dementia we all need to do. You know, I know when and Peter do it, well done, but we all need to do it. Yeah. I mean, we know when we were at school, our teachers walked up and down, didn't they? Because your yeah. brains work better. If you walk, your brains begin to form new connections and so on, as well as all the chemicals it gives us of pleasure and so on. So exercise is so important. And also it's the, I, I, I hate, well, not hate, but it distresses me to see people in care homes, in residential settings, just sitting, doing nothing, because there's nothing more comforting with dementia than sat doing nothing no stimulation it's pure heaven but actually that's dementia's cruel way of of making you feel safe by doing nothing but the opposite is is the truth you, the more you do the more it keeps dementia at bay because you're using your your brain cells just like Jennifer said and to keep them active is key to surviving. Can I give just one more example? Sure. We all know don't we if someone has a stroke nowadays we expect them to improve don't we? <laughs> we do and you yeah. do not improve by sitting in front of a telly. We the people with a stroke improve because of rehabilitation 
and that includes exercise and diet and ex you know the whole lot doesn't it so there is so much we do not sit and do nothing as wendy says <laughs> and it is difficult when i've just seen one of the comments flash up about somebody's mum who sits in front of the TV all day. You know, it is really difficult to convince someone who's become accustomed to that and who is who feels comfortable doing that to go out of their comfort zone to do something else. But with encouragement and finding that key that unlocks a different side to them of, of doing would would be more beneficial for them. But I think really one of the things is that, that um, um, exercising can become a habit, just yeah. as non-exercise can become a habit as well. Yeah. And this yeah. is this is one of the key issues. For me, the exercise is a habit and, and become a virtual obsession to a degree. And and I can see where the tables can turn where people can just sit and that can become an obsession too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much of it has to do with the way that you lived your life pre-dementia. I know mm. that Wendy had said she, she was always typing on a computer and it was a big part of her life so she can continue to do that mm. and, and write that way. And, Keep a blog. Many people might say, how can you keep a blog if you have dementia? Well, I think it tends to stem back to whether we have dementia or not, we are still the people inside that we were to begin with. So if we were active mm -hmm. people, we're active people with dementia. If we were people who sat and did, did typing or something like that, we're that same person with dementia. Good point. Herde, you have a comment? Yes. Um, I want to say that I'm very happy that I'm exercising and walking now, but I never before in my life had time to do it. It was not a priority for me. And today still, I resent that I have to spend so much time exercising, although I'm very happy if I can manage to do it. But my whole life consisted of sort of being in my head and um, working with ideas and writing. And um, it, it's hard for me to do now. And so I, I'm always stuck. Like for example, when I, I have to confess, I prepared for this conference for three days and I've got about um, 17 pages of written notes because that is the only way that I can keep the things I want to say uh, in my memory. And I'm glancing at, at my notes also. But mm. in that time, I wasn't able to go walking. It's for me, it's either the one or the other. If I go out work, walking in the early morning, then I feel good for about two hours. But then my energy, I, I'm just sapped of energy. And it's very hard for me to uh, do anything constructive. So I always used to say that when I'm old, I will go to the gym and exercise because if there's nothing else I can do. Well, I'm now, I'm now old and I, there's not much else I can do, but I still resist that that is how it has to be. <laughs> I have a question for you, Michael, because um, you had recently told me that you had stopped your Facebook and, and all of that. that. That was a big part of your life um, for a while. And I just, we were wondering, how do you cope emotionally when you notice changes in your abilities? Well, I have to tell you, it's very frustrating. I was always the type of person that if I can't give accurate information, I'd rather not give the information at all. And that became part of my problem with my Facebook and the other media things. I realized that I wasn't doing a good enough job to get the right information out there. And for me, that became very frustrating because I don't like putting bad information out there. So I decided to just stop doing it. Uh, and I know there was a lot of people who were still counting on me, but again, my personal feeling is if I can't do it right, don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it was tough. I had to give something up that I like doing and sharing with people. But overall, I think it's probably the best thing that I did. And it's actually given me some more free time now uh, that I can do other things. Okay. And I know that um, Wendy, Hera, and Dr. Jennifer are also blogging and using social media. And Peter has help with his, with Deb. Uh, how, how are you managing all of that? Is, do you get overwhelmed? How are people responding to it? Wendy? I, 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 my, my blog is my memory. It's as simple as that. I write my blog to know what I've been doing, to, to know the feelings and the emotions I've had, or to share the good as well as the bad days to show the reality of dementia. But in, it's basically simply my memory. Otherwise, you know, I can't tell you what I did yesterday unless I've written a blog. But for me, I call Twitter the, my silent world of conversation because I find it really difficult to be in a room with people just all talking. I, I, it's like being in a center of a beehive. You can't, you can't hear conversations. Whereas on Twitter, I can, I can just be me and I can type at my speed. I can answer at my speed. Um, I feel no pressure on Twitter. And I've met the most wonderful people that I would never have met in a million years through social media and simply through having dementia. You know, we, we, we wouldn't have been here with all you lovely people if we didn't have dementia. So dementia, the way I cope with it is to twist it on its head and to find a positive. And so I, I, I'm grateful for the people I've met because they've all been wonderful, especially people with dementia. And Dr. Jennifer? Oh, for, drop the doctor for goodness sake. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a real doctor. You don't need to tell everybody that. I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm, so, I'm so privileged. You know, with my background, you know, and I'm sorry it keeps coming out, but, you know, I used to be in medical education. So my blog is, it's on Facebook um, and I was made to do it. <laughs> you know, I think there's enough everything out there already, but people kept asking me questions, practical questions about dementia. And so I put it up there. And in the end, there were so many, I agreed to do a regular one every Friday answering some particular problem, how to practically do it. And I tell stories because I believe people relate to stories. So it's not about me, it's about how to cope with different situations. I tell stories about my village. I live with what, 200 other people? It's a privilege and an opportunity, isn't it? Because people live here at all stages of dementia. There are people here without dementia, but a majority by far have, and everyone is different. Mm -hmm. And I've been here 10 years now, and I'm still learning. Yeah. So every time I learn something new, we'll find a new way to explain something. That is my blog. And Wendy, I don't know how you do Twitter. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're better yeah, at Facebook you. than me, Jennifer. <laughs> Hmm. that's true well different the different social media platforms have different audiences too yeah so that's something to, you know to take into consideration if, if you decide you want to do something like that hmm. here's another open question how can friends and family best support you i bet oh. you all have something to say to that oh. go ahead wendy yeah well for, for the kindest reasons people can wrap us in cotton wool when, when, when they hear that diagnosis of dementia. Those around us want to protect us for the kindest of reasons, but actually that's the worst thing you can do to disable us before we've lost the capacity to do something. 
So you know, what does it matter if it takes an hour to put on a coat? It means we've still got that self-respect of being able to put on our own coat. And it also means that you can go off and do something else for an hour. So my daughter started to put on my coat right at the beginning. I said to them, if you continue to put on my coat, then I'll forget. And every time I want to go out of my house, you're going to have to drive over here and put on my coat. And they stopped immediately. So, you know, to enable us to learn a different way to it was a fine balance between doing something for us and enabling us to continue to do it ourselves. That's the biggest lesson my daughters have learned, to let go of the fear of what would happen if I'm still allowed to do things. Yes, Herda. I just want to say that my family and especially my husband Peter um, are just amazing in um, in letting me continue my independence that I've always had. Um, Peter and I have always had um, our own separate adventures. You know, we would go uh, on trips, visiting parents or so, each one on our own. But you know, I would go visit both his parents and mine and so on. But we did things like that as individuals. And so today still, the other day I wanted to walk to a place that I've been to often by car, but it's, it's only about two miles away. And um, I just said, I told Peter I'm going and I just set out for it. And then I got trapped be because the quiet roads I was walking on uh, had no crossing over the river. And so I had to, go around blocks and so just trying to find a road that had a river crossing and I got horribly lost and um, I Peter has, has an app on my phone for me to look up where I am I couldn't figure out where the app was and what to do with it so I, I did manage to just google my street the two cross streets where I was and I found out where I was and I could see I was not too far from where I wanted to go but I had to go way around to find a path across the river. So I decided I would uh, I would continue, but by then it, I was so hot and confused and sort of just lost confidence. I called Peter and said, I, I had planned to go there and walk back. I said to him, I'm just not gonna be able to walk back, but I would like to continue on to my my destination and, um, and just if he would pick me up there. So he said, fine. But in the meantime, he'd been watching me on the GPS and he could see how lost I was, but he didn't call me. He waited until I called him. And to mm -hmm. me, that is the most amazing um, gift of independence, independence that I can imagine. And I just wanna add a quick story to that. So I walked up to meet him at our bank, which is in that same complex. And I was sitting outside the bank in the shade uh, in, through, in their drive-through, but there's a little side piece where you can sit on a rock. I was sitting there and then a minute later somebody comes walking out of the bank and, and it's our financial advisor. He comes up to me and says are you okay and he invites me to come and wait in the bank where it's cooler and what had happened is that friends of ours were at that moment visiting him. They knew I had dementia. They saw me through the window and they said to him I wonder if she's okay and so I had three friends right there who were supporting me and bringing me water and making me sit in a cool place. Just, just what, how wonderful the world can be. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. Mm. Okay, so um, I wanted to move into a more sensitive topic. Somebody had asked this question. The panelists seem to be taking charge of their lives and actively working to make their experience as meaningful as possible for themselves and for others. With that in mind, I'm wondering what their thoughts or plans might be for the later stages of their dementia. Has uh, anybody given thought to this? 
I have given very little thought to that subject because I think living well with dementia means living well with dementia. I don't think about the other stages of dementia. I tend to live in the here and now, and I'm extremely stubborn as far as that goes, I think. But I think that's what keeps me from buckling under to it, me personally. Other people have, have other ideas and they like to plan things out. Me, I just like to say yes to everything, run and jump, try the water and just live and breathe every second and not think about anything less than doing that. And I think that's, that's personally for me what keeps me going. Okay, and Michael, you had your hand raised. I have to tell you, I have given this a lot of thought and planning. Uh, it probably started for me about 10 years ago, maybe even longer, but I want to enjoy life as long as possible. But I believe with this disease, there comes a time that I guess life is no longer what I would consider life. And I don't want to be the burden to my family. And if I can no longer enjoy things and I'm unable to do things on my own, uh, I, I think at that point for me, it, it's no longer worth living. And I've taken steps of writing a document that's 30 pages long. It was actually a document that was created by Dr. Stanley Terman on at what point in time you no longer want to be fed and you just want a way out. And the sad part is the laws are really against us. We don't have rights as a person who's living with dementia. And I'm trying to change that, but I gotta tell you, it's something I've been working on for 10 years and I got all kinds of legal people trying to help, but it's not an easy path. While it's not for everybody, it is something that we should have the option if we want to go down that path, just like some who has cancer, who's in serious pain. They no longer want to live. The doctors easily put them out of their misery with the help of drugs. I don't understand why we can't have that simplicity for people who are living with the disease. And I think that needs to change. I hope it will change over time. I don't think it's going to change in my time. But I do think people need to have that right. Mm -hmm. Herda? Um, my thoughts about my end of life stem from my, my whole view of life. And that is that for me, part of being human is being able to communicate. When I can no the longer communicate to the people I love, uh, that I love them, with, and I'm, I'm very um, satisfied with very little yet. I mean, it could even be without speech and just by physical contact. But um, if I can no longer do that, or if I uh, scare my family, and if I'm, uh, if I'm angry all the time, um, I don't want to be there. So uh, I have... And my family and I uh, have started planning 10 years ago for our end of life plans. And we have looked at the financial issues. We put all our papers in order and we review them from time to time. And, um, and we also have made a plan for me to end my life when before I become so disabled that I cannot communicate. Of course, spotting that point is difficult, but I've um, worked out a set of criteria that that my family and I agree on that would be in our family sense a worthwhile life and um, they have agreed to support me um, emotionally uh, and psychically to do that. I plan to do every movement about taking my life by myself so that they will not be involved and um, I, like Michael I will also I'll probably start with stopping eating and drinking. And, um, you know, then it, it's, it, I, we have other ways too that we've planned for that, that we could, would, I myself could do it without putting my family in jeopardy. But at the same time, I'm very much aware 
that our lives are not under our control. Uh, I may not be able to execute those plans. And I've told my children that if at any point they feel ethically that they cannot do that, I want them to not do that. But if some of them still feel able to support me, that the others who don't feel like it don't interfere. And everybody has agreed to that. So for me, it has given me the greatest peace ever to know that I will not have my body outlive my mind by sometimes as, as many as 10 years, uh, where the food goes in one end, the digestive products go out the other end, and, and it's, you are just like a channel for that with no, um, no ability to make your mark on life. For some people, it is enough, the few moments of clarity that people might have. But for me, it is just not something that, that I want to experience or have my family experience. But I, I absolutely like Michael, I don't, I don't agree that it's for everybody. And I also want to say something about death with dignity. It's, it's for me a mistake that people who advocate for uh, assisted suicide use the term death with dignity. Because I say that there is no bigger dignity than a family who cares for someone with dementia or any other illness until they die at home in their beds. To me, every loving support is a support of dignity. Mm. Mm. Wendy? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, to make sure that my daughters knew how I felt. And I wanted to hear their views on, on end of life. And I think the most powerful lesson we've learned as a, a family is the power of talking. Because if we hadn't have talked, then I wouldn't have known that both my daughters had totally opposite views on end of life. And it wasn't until we did talk that they heard my view. And so it was, it was creating the options for my life and my death, rather taking away that pressure from them of falling out when I couldn't have put it right. They now know that we've talked about those things and it's all registered with my doctor and all the legal stuff that they no longer have to make that emotional decision at a time when you're least able to make emotional decisions you know we we, we, we I told them that I wanted to talk about that so we can carry on living and enjoy life. So that's what we've done. We've filed it away and then now I'm living again. So it's, um, people call it a difficult conversation to have, but I call it an un uncomfortable conversation. It's not difficult if you say the words, but it can be uncomfortable. And I think it's so important to get your views expressed before you lose that power of speech. Hmm. Jennifer, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, <laughs> we live well with dementia and we can die well too. And as a doctor, you obviously, I believe in prolonging life. I do not believe in prolonging death. There are two hmm. issues, aren't there? And yeah. I do feel very strongly about it. And you're right, we have to give people opportunity we can't force people opportunity to talk while they're able, which is why I've made my the video, which is what quarter of an hour, I think. So I'll send the link to Marianne. And if anyone's interested, Marianne can send them the link. That's the simplest way, I think. OK, that's great. Well, thank you all for being candid and honest with us and expressing your feelings on this subject, which I know is emotional and, and difficult. So we all appreciate that very, very much. We do have some questions um, in the chat that I wanted to get to. Um, 
Mark is asking, how much fluctuation do you have from day to day and what fluctuates mm -hmm. most? i.e. the ability to communicate verbally, understand others, short-term versus long-term memory, et cetera. Ooh. Michael? I don't think there's an easy answer to that because we're all very different. And yeah. what might impact me won't impact somebody else. And yeah. uh, if there's one thing that I learned is I can't even figure out what this disease does. And if I can't figure it out, I sure know that doctors and other people can't figure it out. So I guess for me is I, I kind of go with the flow of what I'm capable of doing at the moment. And I do know that as I get aggravated or uh, there's pressure on me, my brain goes south completely. And it, it, you, you have to try to relax no matter what, because you end up beating yourself up. At least I do. If, I can't think of something and I have to let it go. I have to let it go because if I don't let it go, it just snowballs and snowballs and I'm, and I'm unable to do anything. So uh, that's how I feel. Ooh. I find um, for me personally, I know how I am today right now, but I don't know how I was yesterday um, because I can't recall how I was yesterday. So it's a question for me that I just can't answer because I only know how I am now, if that makes sense. Ooh. <laughs> uh, who's what who's next jennifer jennifer well my difficulty is i get hallucinations you know <clears throat> dreadful hallucinations and but no one else can see that Ooh. so if i'm not right it could be because of that and people can't see why and it can cause great difficulties because you know, I see someone sitting on a chair in the corner and I go up to them, of course, there's nobody there. Or I step aside on the <laughs> stairs because someone's coming up and of course they aren't, or I'm attacked by a dog when I'm not. And it's my reactions, or I think I'm being chased by bees and, you know, and I'm terrified of them. And people wonder why I'm behaving in a certain way. Now, people who know me, I educate them, is to help me deal with it. And they help me deal with it. Um, by understanding, not by telling me to be not to be so stupid, because I'm not being stupid, I can't help it. But the point I'm making is that I can vary from day to day with reason, for reasons that nobody else can see or understand if they don't know me. But we're all different, aren't we? There are other reasons as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wendy? Yeah, yeah. I, again, my, my days are different. Uh, I think it was Michael that said if you if you put under pressure, that's the worst possible thing, because I can't make decisions to save my life, you know. So I have to stay calm and just go in one direction, to just follow one conversation, one of anything, because I can't cope with two of anything. And on um. Bad days, my my really bad days. I I can only try and understand them when I'm coming out of them, because when I'm in them, then they're all consuming. But coming out of them, I can think, oh, that's why I felt bad. That's why something happened. I don't always remember, but I know I've been in a bad state. So it's um, it, it's a bit like Peter said of living in this moment, because that's the only moment you you can be sure of how you are. Right, and Jennifer, did you want to add something? I found out I was replying to something on the line and I can't remember what Wendy said. I wasn't making notes. It just proves I have dementia. <laughs> yeah. I think Gerda wanted to say something. Oh, yes. Um, thank you, Wendy. Um, I just think that for me, keeping a very, I won't say rigid, but I've got to have a very good routine. Oh, yeah. Every day. If I don't follow a routine, it just, my life just goes 
completely out of whack. And uh, I also know that um, when I overdo certain things, uh, for example, when I, uh, uh, when I speak at a conference or like preparing for day, today's discussion, I just completely overdo it because that's the only way that I can have confidence to even be here. And I know that this afternoon when this is over, I will be capable of doing nothing. Um, and so I know in order to make my life work at all, I have to admit that I cannot do anything more and I have to withdraw into myself. And like Wendy said before, you know, people just sit there and this one most wonderful thing of the mentor is just to be sit and close your eyes and be on your phone and be in your head. So I have to allow myself to do that sometimes because uh, I get to a point where I can't even, I can't watch TV. I cannot listen to the radio. I can just be lying on my bed with, with a, just letting the thoughts twirl through my head. And often I fall asleep and that helps a lot. But um, so it is somewhat manageable to make your, to, to work for getting your best days more often if you can follow those. But it needs a lot of help. It needs a lot of help from my husband, Peter, because I want to accept everything that goes on. And then he takes out our calendar and he looks at it and says, look, these are the things we're doing this week. Uh, can you really do this as well? And then I say, oh, well, maybe I can't. So, um, so I think management helps a lot. But for me, in order to do something that I really like, like participating in this, I have to overdo it and then I have to withdraw. So it's a, it's a trade off all the time, but, um, but it's worth it. Yeah, you, you, have to, you have to choose your battles. And for me, the, just like you said, Gerda, the, the, when you want to do something, then it can be exhausting preparing wonderful to take part and exhausting afterwards but that's the just the price we pay and people that's that's why people sometimes question our diagnosis because they see the best of us because of the work we've done to give people the best of us but they don't see the collapse afterwards the they're just sitting, you know, they, they see us as we are when we're trying to be at our best. All that is very insightful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're coming up to the end of our hour, which is disappointing, but I did want to ask one question. And I know that Hera um, touched on this a little bit before. And this is about touch. Well, let me just see if I can find it here in my list of questions. Does touch have a place in supporting well being in dementia? And if so, please give examples of positive touch that may be beneficial to people with dementia. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Go ahead, Jennifer. Of course, touch is important, and that's why COVID has decimated us, isn't it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> because COVID is so important, you know, the touch, the reassuring touch, the endomorphins that are released when people are touched, the, the belonging, the communication of caring, the, the calming, it's all kind of gone out the window. It's so important. And just one thing, one care home that I visited actually had touch in their care plans for the people yeah. that lived. It was wonderful because they realized how important it was. Um, yeah. I could tell you hundreds of stories about how touch, the right touch has transformed people's lives, but we haven't got time now. Let's give someone else to say something. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so important to, you know, just a, a hold of the hand, just that hug, to, just that emotional connection that it brings and, the calming effect it has. It's, it's wonderful for, for most people anyway, 
but for people with dementia, it's it's something tangible that they can feel. Herda, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I wanted to say that I don't think um, it is the case only with pe for people with dementia. No, it is no. a case for all, especially older people, but for everybody um, that 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 touch goes out of your life if you live on your own or um, if your children are far away if, or if mm. you don't have children. I mean, even the touch of an animal means yeah. a lot. If you have a, a, a dog or a cat or a pet, uh, it means so much to be in touch with another living being. But uh, after COVID, there is nothing, was nothing as wonderful for me as being able to hug my grandchildren again. And mm. I warned them. I warned them that they, they're going to get so many hugs, they're going to get annoyed. But, um, but it is, and, and it, it, is, it is sad to me. Well, in the United States, we're a hugging culture. And I came from South Africa, not a hugging culture. So, uh, so I had to learn to do that. But it's not that I didn't enjoy touch. It's just that it wasn't so publicly displayed all the time. But uh, I'm thinking of, of something I've seen on the news in different contexts, but of somebody standing in a in a plaza or something and saying, free hugs. Mm. And, um, you know, people immediately think this is some perfect or something. But I honestly think that there should be a place or a place for people who want to just go and um, hug people in a a retirement center, you know, uh, make friends with them. Of course, you can't just hug somebody, somebody who hasn't spoken to them. But I find that usually, <laughs> after you speak to somebody for a while, most people will react with, may I hug you? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think I want to make it clear to, to other people, and even semi-strangers, that hugs are not something that that I think are strange or so, but, and I'd be very willing, and I need it more than they need it. I, I often say you get it right for people with dementia and you get it right for so many others. You know, if you think of what people with dementia need, it just applies to everybody. Well, that's all wonderful. Thank you everyone for coming and attending mm. our first virtual Q&A. Mm. So I think it's been a, a little bit of a success and I am hoping to offer more events in the future. We've got some big ideas. So I've added you all to the mailing list. So each week you'll get an email from us, what's going on with all those authors, introducing a new author, the new podcast and other things. So you'll learn about future events that way. So check your inbox each week and visit our blog at allsauthors.com where you can find all of the podcasts for these five panelists and listen to their stories in depth and also read their blog posts and almost 300 other authors writing about Alzheimer's and dementia from personal experience. So we have a wealth of information. We have a bookstore, which you can um, you, uh, look up by particular subject, if you are looking for um, a situation like caring for a parent, caring for a spouse, uh, caregiver guides, Lewy body dementia, all different kinds of subject areas. Uh, we try to make it easy for you to find that. So you can find it all at allsauthors.com. And you can also follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, we will be posting the questions that we didn't get around to on the Facebook page. So if you're on Facebook, um, hopefully in a day or so, you can find them there. And if the panelists have time to visit the Facebook page and want to respond, they can, but they're not under any obligation to give us any more of their precious time at this point. And I just want to say, remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Brilliant. Mm. Thank you so much.